Coming up on iPads in the Classroom, it's our 100th episode, so I'm choosing my favorite apps. Hi, my name is Guy Trenin, and this is iPads in the Classroom from Tech Edge, and this is our 100th episode, so I get to decide exactly what I'm going to put on this one, and these are my favorite apps. They're all free, so you really want uh, to pay attention. Uh, the first one is Flipboard, and I've talked about Flipboard. I've actually talked about most of these apps uh, throughout the two years we've been doing this, but I think it's worth going back to them because they do present some of the best things that you can do with iPads. So the first one is Flipboard, and what Flipboard does is it allows you to take your media streams and add to them and create a magazine-like format. So this is my cover stories. It includes a collection from everything that I'm pulling from. And it's got some things about the Olympics, it's got some things about apps and other things that I pay attention to. Here's another example, and this is what, I'm sorry, what my Twitter feed looks like. So Twitter usually has those 140 characters and a link, but when you use Flipboard, what you get instead is the beginning of the stories and the ability to bring them up. So they start loading in the background, and if you tap on a specific story, the rest of it comes up, and you can actually further pursue it on the original website. But what you're getting then is instead of these short 140 character messages, actual stories that you can then decide if you want to use or not. You can see that if there are a few shorter messages that don't actually have links, they would show up in the list. So this one is Flipboard. I have used it from the time I started with my first iPad and I'm still using it on a daily basis. If you haven't ever used it, if you have multiple media streams and you're looking for a way to have them all together and to be able to send from one app, this would be the app I would choose. The next one uh, I want to talk about is called Google Earth. And Google Earth is one of those things that I find extremely useful and a lot of fun to look at. So this dress now is zooming in on where we are right now broadcasting from on the, in the University of Nebraska campus. And it is remarkably accurate as to where we are. And then going anywhere else, let's try Rome, Italy. I love this piece to do with students zooming out and zooming back in into the area gives students the notion that the earth is really round and the notion of a globe instead of a flat map. It's a great illustration and you can start zooming in and as you zoom in more and more details show up. Details about businesses, details about transportation, but also photos and Wikipedia. So you can see that these are photos they show up on the side with some details about the photo. So you can see um, this photo inside Rome. And again, we can switch out. And this is information about the same site. So there are multiple ways to look at anything we can find on the map. You can use it when you're teaching geography. You can use it when you're teaching history. You can use it just to tour a new place or to actually examine the place you are at. So there are multiple educational purposes, but sometimes it's just fun to tour around and see what you can see in a place you've already been or a place you've never been to. Um, in my case, I keep going back to uh, Giza and seeing the pyramids of Egypt, which I've never seen uh, with my own eyes. So it's something to do. So this is Google Earth. Something I use a lot at work, though, also from Google, is Google Drive. Google Drive allows you to share documents, to edit documents that are all on the cloud. So multiple users, usually up to four or five, can edit the same document at the same time. It's also a fantastic way to submit work. So my students submit most of the papers in my classes to Google Drive, just share it with me. They actually share a folder and everything in that folder gets shared with me. So I have access to the work, they have access to the work, and if we look at a specific student, <laughs> so this is an assignment from a student. 
and you can see the highlighted areas and those have comments attached to them so when I get a paper from a student I can actually write comments about what should be done differently or feedback to the next version of the paper or the next version of the product. Anyway, it's a way to communicate effectively with your students, again, without sending papers back and forth, without even sending files back and forth. All you do is you write on the document itself, you add a comment, and then you let them know that the comments are ready and they can come and they can actually go through and edit the same document so there's no reason to move back and forth. For me, it's probably the greatest tool for teaching that I have right now that is connected to assignments. It's better than anything else I've worked with in the past, including documents from Word with comments and all the other options that we have through our uh, learning management systems. So Google Drive is a great option. If you've never used it or if you used it only on the computer, try it on the iPad. It's nice, it's sleek, and it goes with you everywhere. Uh, another feature that is there that is worth mentioning is that you can actually download a copy into your device so you can edit even when you're offline and it'll sync once you're online again. The next app I want to talk about is Overdrive. And Overdrive is an app that allows you to log in to many, many libraries around the US. And what it does is it allows you to use your library card to borrow books both audiobooks and digital books uh, without actually showing up at the library. There's a nice selection at least at our library. So um, I belong to Lincoln City Libraries here in Lincoln and I have some uh, books on my shelf. So there's just an audiobook with, with the information from uh, about working with uh, Overdrive. But if you want to see it, what I've downloaded, you can see that logging in into the library. You can see that you can search, you can get a new book. So here's a, a new book that I see. If the marker here is dark, that means that it's a book I can borrow right now. And let's just look at a specific book. You can see that there are multiple options. You can download it, download it straight into Kindle. So if you're a Kindle user and you want to download it into your Kindle app, you can from here. You will need to know your Kindle uh, password. You can do an overdrive read, and I'll show you in a second what it looks like. And you can do an Adobe ePublication ebook. All of these are available, not for all books. So you have to know what you're looking for. And if you want to start reading, you just press on borrow. You sign in with your library card number. Uh, and then you have multiple options of reading it. Right now, here's the book I'm reading. This is the book we just downloaded. And if you want to read, you just open it in your browser. That's the easiest I found. And you just keep that page open. It'll remember where you are even if you close it. And this is what it'll look like inside. It always reminds you how to do this. And after very few directions, you can start reading. This is a great piece. It allows you to know where you are in the book and how long those chapters are. And the percent is really, really important because you can change the size of the font on any of the pages. So you can see, let's just start the book. So if you're here, you can actually change the size of the text. So if you can't see very well, or if you're tired like I was last night and you need a little bit uh, bigger font, you can do that very easily. If you want more words on the page, you just make it a little bit smaller. And then it looks more like a print on a regular page. And you always get the measure of where you are in the chapter. This is one out of eight pages in the chapter and what percent of the book you've already read. You can also bookmark. So I can bookmark, this is where I'm at. Next time I open it, it'll go back to the bookmark and then it'll remember the bookmark. The other things that you can do is you can do search. You can search for actually for uh, word meanings and things like that. So there are lots of options in this uh, overdrive when you're reading a library book. I just love it because if I feel like a book, I can go on the library website pick my book up and five minutes, less than five minutes, two minutes later, I'm already deep into that book 
and enjoying myself without actually having to go to the library. You also don't have to return it. All that happens is after about three weeks, the book disappears from your library. So if you read a little bit slower, you would have to uh, make sure that it doesn't disappear me to read. So this is called Overdrive, one of my favorites. I had this app for a long time and I didn't use it much. And in the last few months, it really became something that I use on a daily basis. Uh, the next app that I want to talk about is actually a teaching app and it's one of those apps that despite the fact that I don't use it in my everyday teaching, I think it's one of the best things out there and that is TinyTap. And TinyTap allows the user to create different kinds of books that kids can interact with through oral language and not just through print. And there are lots of examples online. There's a whole market where you can pay for ones, but there's also hundreds and upon hundreds of free games that were created, uh, books slash games. And I, I will show you something somebody else created, although I've created things myself. It just shows you the potential of working with something like that. So this is our book, who is bigger? Let's find out. Who is bigger? So you can hear ants or the mouse. So you can hear that it's working not with text right now, although you could add the text. It's working with an oral question. That's right. The mouse is and it reacts to ant. touch. So kids can actually participate. The, the chicken. Who is bigger now? Correct. The so chicken. You can see that if you get it correctly, you get a balloon or you get some other uh, reaction that says you're right and there's a reaction if you're wrong. And this was a very simple game. There are more sophisticated games and it really, it depends on your uh, ingenious genes, I would say. And the options are really, really limitless. And whenever I meet teachers, especially teachers working with English language learners or teachers who work with young children, I say, if you have only one app, TinyTap should be that app. You can do so much with it, whether you design it yourself or you get something that somebody else has designed. So this has been our 100th episode. And it's been fantastic to be with you for our 100th episodes. Uh, I'm pretty sure very few of you have watched all 100. But if you have, let me know. And we'll send you something special. And we'll see you next time on iPads in the Classroom.